What we're going to be looking at today is easy access to digital content. Now, this is quite a broad term. We're not going to discuss how we're going to improve bandwidth. We're not, we can't do anything about that. Um, that's a discussion for another day. We're just going to look at one or two ways that you can, one or two little tricks that you can use to make sure that it becomes easier for, um, for, for your, your, especially your learners, but also your colleagues or anyone that you're really sharing digital content with, that it becomes a little bit easier for them to access the digital content. Right, so um, the first thing we want to look at is what do we actually talk about when we refer to ease of access? Now, the bottom line is it does not matter how wonderful your resources are if they are difficult to access. You can create the best possible presentation or video or whatever the thing might be, but if it's difficult for a person to access that content, then it's not really going to be a very effective, um, end up being a very effective mm -hmm. tool. It's as simple as that. So bottom line is, the idea of making sure that all learners and parents have quick, easy access to digital resources. Now, again, as we said, we're not going to discuss the internet side of things because bandwidth, we understand, is always a bit of a, a bit of a headache. We're just looking simply at how do we make access to digital resources easier. Now, one thing that is incredibly important and something that I think is it's it's a, it's a simple yet very complicated thing at the same time, in, and that is device consideration. While the majority of us, when we are going to create resources, we are likely going to end up using um, our laptops or our desktops to create digital content. You're not likely going to be setting up a presentation on your mobile device. And the problem is what happens is we forget that few learners have access to laptops or desktops. We might have a computer lab at a school, but our idea is we want to get more learners accessing digital resources. And the reality, for most of us is that the, the, the key lies in using cell phones there. A lot of learners have cell phones. I understand a lot of learners also don't have cell phones, but when we com comparatively, a cell, a cell phone is a better, um, is a more likely, more viable vehicle for your content at the end of the day. So what becomes very important when you are creating digital resources, you need to be aware of how these learners are going to access resources on a, on a cell phone. A simple example of that, very often we, <clears throat> we create um, a very complicated long document, we convert it to PDF and then we send it to a person. But that's not always a very easy thing to navigate on a mobile device. We feel it is straightforward enough to navigate this because we are, we are viewing it on a laptop or on a desktop, which is where we created it. And on a laptop, on a desktop, it is a very easy and straightforward um, resource to access. But this is not, the, in, likely, in all likelihood, what learners are going to be accessing it with. So a very simple concept that you need to consider is when you are, de when you are developing a resource, be aware of how it is going to be, it be displayed on a mobile device. <clears throat> a simple example, lots of teachers are making use of um, WhatsApp to distribute their resources. And it's a platform that can work very well for you if used correctly. But what you have to do is you have, if you're sending these resources, mm -hmm. open it up on your phone and try and see how, what, how easy it is to navigate these resources. Are you able to really um, effectively engage with these resources or is it something that you struggle with? And if it's something that you struggle with, you might need to consider re adjusting it in some way, how you're going to present this content to your learners. Now, we're not going to be looking at that today. What we want to look at is this concept of dynamic versus static content. Now, we are, as, as with many of my sessions, those of you who have been in some of my sessions before, um, I like to bring a more theoretical side to things and then before we dive into the practical element. Because we don't understand why we are doing things, then there's not much sense in just doing it. So we first want to look at why we do things versus what we actually want to do. So the concept of dynamic versus static content isn't exactly a, a digital resources in terms of schooling environment. This is, is, is more a, a concept that is related to websites, but it, the, the concept applies 100% here. So 
When we look at static content, static content in its simplest definition is static content is content that doesn't change. So an example of that would be a video that you've made. This will be a static, will be static content because it's not likely that you're going to go and edit the video. You might, who knows, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But um, if you take that content and you email it to someone and they download it, it is static. It's that bottom line, it can't be edited and can't be changed. The same applies to a, um, a, a PowerPoint. If you created a PowerPoint and you send the PowerPoint via WhatsApp to learners or via whatever platform that you are using, you've created a static um, document. In other words, that which you've created doesn't, is not going to change. Um, static content and this is a key, one of the key differences between the two. Static content is usually, not always, but usually it is hosted on a local device. What that means is I send you a file, you download that file, and now that file is on your computer. I don't have any ability to change that file that is on your computer anymore. So once you've made a copy, there are now two copies of that same file in the universe. I still have mine, which I might be able to edit. So you can create a Word document or a PowerPoint document, anything like that, and you can still edit it. Um, but if I change it, it's not going to change on your side necessarily. So that is a key thing to understand. So typically, we're looking at PDF, PowerPoints, Word documents, things like these. This is very much the way that digital resources obviously came about. This is the way that things were created, and this is the way that um, We've been used to using using the, um, using our computers and our laptops for a long time, but things have changed dramatically now in the sense that this concept of dynamic content has now moved beyond just the, the the more complicated things, and it's become a lot easier and simpler for us to maintain. So when we're looking at dynamic content, this refers to content that changes. So in other words, I can send you something. But if I need to change something on that, I can change it on my side and it changes for you as well. It's not only on my device where I change this. Um, there's lots of different practical uh, uses of that that, that, that we can um, talk about um, if we still have a bit of time at the end. But in the simplest sense, what that means is I can, if, if I created a document um, explaining a certain concept, and I send it to you, and a very simple thing, I pick up, oh, there's a spelling mistake. I can change that spelling mistake, and that is reflected for everyone. Or I can realize, but wait, here's something that is not well explained enough. My learners have come back to me and said, sir, I still don't understand this concept, and I can add explanations to that same file, and it is updated for everyone who accesses the file. Now, that is done because these files are hosted online. We've all heard of cloud um, cloud computing, cloud, etc., etc., all of those things. Um, but it's what, what it, essentially what it means is the files that you are accessing, the files that you're using, are not actually on your device anymore, but they are hosted online somewhere. They're not accessible to, um, or they they become accessible to whoever you want it to become accessible to, and in whatever way you want it to become accessible. Now. On the one hand, we can look at the, 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 the modern transformation of your traditional Office um, suite. So in other words, you can look at Office 365, which is an online version of Microsoft Office. And in that, I can create a Word document. I can share that Word document. And we actually all have the same Word document. So it updates on everyone's computer. Um, and then the alternative to that is looking at the G Suite, the, the whole Google platform, using Google Docs and Google um, Slides, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, we're not going to talk about the, the, the benefits and the, the pros and the cons of those two platforms. That's something you can discover for yourself. Um, but both of them have the ability to do that. But more importantly, a lot of the other web apps that we use, especially in the, in the whole um, educational technology field, also use a lot of these or also make use of this dynamic kind of content. So if I just think of some of the, the examples of things we've done, um, webinars we've done in the past, something like a Quizlet or something like a Quizzes. These are all based on um, our online resources, things that you can change afterwards, things that you can modify if that is something that you need to be able to do. So it's, it's, there's a key 
the key concept here is the difference between having a resource only on your local machine versus having a resource that is online. And this is a, it, I, I've really simplified this concept, but I've always felt that in a big way, if you are able to make this transition, make this step from static local hosted files to a more online dynamic presence, obviously there are lots of, there, there, there's, there's a, um, uh, uh, the barrier that you sometimes will run into is accessibility um, in terms of internet usage or bandwidth, etc. etc. But this is the process that we are starting to move towards. Everything is starting to move in this direction, and um, it's it's going to make your life easier if you make the switch sooner rather than later. Now, what we're effectively going to be looking at today is link sharing and the different ways of how we can go about link sharing. So the bottom line is if we are going to be sharing with links, then you know that the content that you are going to be sharing, it's very possible that it's dynamic content because we are all directed to a central place. If I share something with another person, that person clicks on that link and he, will, he or she will see the same content that I will see on my side because we are both, no one's accessing my computer, we are both accessing the same link that is hosted online. Um, and the other big benefit of this is smartphones, smart devices, these mobile devices, they work well with cloud hosted resources. The better sites, the better um, uh, edtech tools out there all have ways of um, minimizing the content so that it actually becomes, becomes quicker and easier to view on a mobile device. They know that the physical size of a mobile device screen is such that you don't need to have the same quality photos and videos and things like that on a cell phone that you have on a larger screen. So they take the screen size, the resolution and things like that into account. And they've got algorithms that will actually downsize images for you in order to present it in that way. There's also, there's lots of other benefits that you can keep in mind. A locally hosted file, everything that is part of that display of the file needs to be sent along with that. So that's more data automatically. But if it's an online hosted file, a an online platform will do a lot of the heavy lifting for you and the thing that you see on your end is actually a lot lower in terms of data usage than a an entire file would be. Um, and of course, as we say now, sharing a link means you're probably sharing dynamic content, which you can change and update as you go. The, the, the benefits of this cannot be overstated. Um, an example of this is you could share, for example, um, I'm an English teacher, or was an English teacher at least, so I always use examples from, from my background, but I can set up a guide to a novel. So I'll set up a guide to Life of Pi, and as we progress, we add more and more details to it. We'll add um, extra descriptions about the characters, etc. So you can start with something quite simple, and the learners know what the link is to that, but it slowly but surely keeps on growing and becoming more um, more robust as you continue the development of, of something like that. Um, so one thing that we do need to keep keep um, be aware of, there's a lot of talk about um, internet security these days because it has exploded now over the past few months, the, the general use of internet. The first thing I'd, I'd like to point out to is, is very often when we're referring to, to people have been hacked, or etc. It's usually a case of people did not pick a strong enough password. So be careful of, of, of passwords and picking strong passwords and just writing them down. There's also a big thing called soft hacking where you literally have written down your password on a piece of paper. It's lying in your classroom. Someone picks that up and then they go into your account. And now you've been hacked, but someone just managed to get your password. Um, but a lot, most, most online resources that you're going to be accessing will have reasonably good security in terms of not just allowing people in. But there's a small little tip that you can keep in, um, keep, that you can keep in mind. Now, if we're going to look at this URL over here, um, for those of us who are not certain what, what we're talking about, the URL is essentially the link that we are referring to. This is the, 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 um, the link that tells the that tells your browser where to go fetch the information on the internet. Now, 
all URLs start with a either HTTP or HTTPS. Keep in mind that little s over there, essentially, it doesn't exactly, but essentially it means secure. So when you're accessing um, resources, there's been a big drive since about 2015, 2016, where all websites are they're trying to force websites to become all of them to use HTTPS, which is a system that allows for better security on the website. It's a little technical thing, but just be mindful of that. If you're using a browser like Google Chrome, it'll actually tell you, um, they, you can see in the link at the top, if there's a little, you won't be able to see mine now, but you'll see there's a little um, icon of a padlock over there. That means it's using HTTPS, it's secure. If it wasn't using that, it would say not, not secure over there. That doesn't mean you can't use it. It's just something to be careful of and to be mindful of. Um, but there are sometimes there's no way around. Some sites haven't added the security yet. Most notably in, in South African context, almost all of our universities are still on HTTP and not on HTTPS. So it is, it is a bit of a security risk there, but um, it's something that a lot of websites are slowly but surely changing. But it is quite a, for a well-established site, it's quite an expensive um, process to change. Now, now we're going to get to the more practical side of things, the practical demonstrations. And that is looking at QR codes and Bitly links. When to use, which one, what they actually are, and why they are quite useful to use. Now, um, a simple example of a Bitly link, you'll see the attendance. I'll just repost it again in the chat. There I've used the Bitly link. Now, if you were to actually view the um, the... Okay, I don't have it open now. But um, the link itself um, that you're actually opening, if you look in the chat window, it actually looks like that. Now, both work because both of them are clickable, so it's not a difficult thing to do. But the one just looks a little bit better. So what we want to look at now first is we're first going to go into, the, into a bit.ly and exactly what a bit.ly actually is and when and why we use bit.ly's. Um, Right, so when we're talking about a bit.ly, bit.ly has just become a very widely used term for what's essentially a link shortener. Um, so what a link shortener does, uh, when we use online tools, lots of the digital tools that we use, they will end up generating very long links. Now, if, if some of you have been using the, the Office 365 platform, you might notice that they, the links that those that, that generate in the Office 365 platform are extremely long. They really, really are just very, very long. And, but there are other things out there that generate incredibly long links as well. So what a link shortener really does, um, it, it, it just changes a link shortener will take a long link and it'll change it into something that's a lot more easy to navigate. So for example, Here's a link. The link that you see over there is actually the link to this presentation itself. And it changes it to something that looks like that. The um, HTTPS, you'll see it's the secure one, bit.ly slash and then a random back half. So it'll generate a random back half for you. It doesn't have to generate um, or you can decide what you want to do because what you also have the option to do is you can have a custom back half as well. So you can change this to something that's easy to type. Now, the bigger, one of the real advantages of this is if the link is short, short enough, now all of you will see this presentation on your screen, but none of you are able to click on anything, of course, because it's a presentation. So if I needed you to access this, yes, on the one hand, I can just copy and paste the link into the chat screen, but sometimes that's not an option. Sometimes we want someone to be able to type out a link, then this becomes a very useful thing to do, um, to actually have a shorter link that someone can access quite easily because you can simply retype it. Um, one thing to take note of with Bitly's, and this is something that people sometimes get a little bit confused with, it is case sensitive. So in other words, if you were to type 3BNW and lowercase UVP, you would not get to the same, to the same page as this one will get you to. So when we're looking at link shorteners, the bottom line is there are many different ones out there. We're going to focus on Bitly today because Bitly is 
by far and away the most widely used link shortener, right? It, in general, in my opinion, this is just personal preference, I think it has the best functionality. It's one of the easiest ones to use, um, but the free version has some limitations, of course. And then one of the disadvantages of Bitly is because it is such a widely used one, um, a lot of the custom backends have already been used. So remember, once a, a custom backend has been used once, the back half at least that we're referring to, it can't be used again. So you are automatically a little bit limited in that sense. Now, another one that is quite cool that, that, that's um, really grown, I think, in, in, recent, in recent months, in, fun, in, in use at least, is bit.do. It does exactly the same thing, really, as Bitly. It gives you the same functionality, and it's very similar to Bitly. Uh, one of the things that it doesn't have, that Bitly has, and we will look at that now, is the Chrome extension, which is incredibly useful to, uh, to use on Bitly. And in general, Bitly just has a, has, has a bit of a nicer and easier um, interface to work with. But do works perfectly fine, but it's, it's, it's not really something that, um, or Bitly just looks better, I think, when, you, when you're going to use it the first time. But do, however, because it's quite new, has not, there's a lot of custom backends that are still available that you can actually still use. Tiny URL is actually more here just out of curiosity because Tiny URL is kind of the grandfather of the link shortness. This one was, to a large extent, the thing that started all of it. Um, it works, but simply put, it doesn't work as well as the others do. I just put it there because I think you, you probably have encountered Tiny URLs or very possibly have, and there's lots of people that, that are still using Tiny URL um, because it was the one that was kind of the first one around. However, um, the newer ones just offer a lot more functionality. So when do we actually want to use a link shortener? Because I think this is, this, this is bottom line um, what a lot of us are asking. Okay, so when is this thing actually a practical, practical, useful tool to be able to use, especially in the classroom? So when you create links that people might need to manually retype, now, if we look again, if we, if we go to the chat screen again, no one is going to retype that incredibly long Google link that we shared there. Um, it just takes, it's, it's, it's going to take forever, firstly. And secondly, 99 out of, out of 100 times, you're going to have one little character wrong somewhere, and it won't work. So another option when we want to use it, when links are very long, but you prefer to have a shorter link to display. So let's say you don't want to have this very long, clumsy link to display. You actually want a nice short link that works, um, that works quite, it's easy for you to access. And then um, another thing that's also quite useful when we want to track activity of a specific link, because this is a little part of Bitly that lots of people aren't aware that it really does. It's something that we use quite a lot or that I use quite a lot, but it, it's actually quite a, a useful little element that's also built into it. Um, so one other thing that you need to keep in mind, and this little note that, that, that's popped up here at the bottom, if you are going to send a file to someone, or if you're going to send an email to someone, anything like that, you need to keep in mind that most applications actually allow you to just highlight text and to insert a link. So you can highlight a piece of text, you can say create a link, and then you can just give that um, link a URL. When you do this, a link shortener isn't actually necessary. So if you're going to shorten a link and then use that as the link for that text, we'll look at that in a second as well, then it doesn't really make sense to use it. However, um, what is still useful is the ability to track the activity on that link. So. We're going to dive into Bitly itself now, but just to show you very quickly how it works. So when we create a Bitly link, um, it's quite simple. We'll get our link, a long link. We'll paste it here. It'll give us the option to customize our link. So all the different things that we can do, we can give it a title, which makes it a lot easier to find when you actually want to track it. So a general rule of thumb, it's useful to actually um, to add a, to just add a, a, a title. Um, I see someone. Yeah, so, so sorry. Uh, um, uh, Pukula, can you just yes. turn off your camera because I think it's it's just 
Um, it's going to make it a little bit easier for everyone who might be struggling with bandwidth. So, uh, Mr. Pakula, if you can just switch off the camera. Right, so um, we're just going to go on. Then, what's also, what, what also works very well is the ability to change the back half of a, um, of a link. So, in other words, if you want to change it to something that you want people to remember. So, another example of this that I just want to, I'm just going to give it, um, just going to type something in the chat again. If you, and I sincerely hope um, all of you have been here by now. Um, if you go to our, right, if, if you are, if you um, have been to our website yet, um, we use a Google site that has a much longer URL um, than the one that I've just posted over there. So we use a bit.ly because it shortens it to something that's easier to remember. So people can go access it quite a lot. Um, so that's the idea. That's one of the ideas behind using a bit.ly as well, is creating a link that can be remembered and can be used again. Um, then another little trick that people sometimes forget is adding a little tag. Now we're going to look at this in a minute as well. Because if you are going to start tracking your links, and never mind that, if you've already created a link and you want to go find it again, to share it again, adding these is very useful. So what is possibly going to happen, a lot of us have really dived into the digital world um, of teaching this year. So you might already be creating bit.ly links, but you might want to be able to use those same links again next year. If you haven't added tags or haven't added titles, then good luck. You're going to find it very difficult to find any of those links again. Um, and then we, I'm going to show you how the extension works as well. The extension is a great way to create links very quickly and very easily. So what we're going to do is we're going to dive straight into Bitly now. I'm going to take you to the site and just show you how, it actually, how the whole thing actually works. Right, let's just give it a second to load. Okay, so if you go to the site the first time, yours will not look like this. Yours might look a little bit different. Mine, I've already um, logged in. So you'll see here over at the top, my name is, is um, shows over there. So very good idea. Make sure that you log in. Bitly is not an app that you can download. Bitly is a, it, it's, it's an entirely web-based app um, that you're going to use just to shorten your, shorten your links with. Right, so it is a, um, and we, I'm going to obviously give you the link to the, you, you'll get at the end of the session, you'll get a link with links with all the presentations, um, as well as links to the various tools that we're using. This, this session itself is a bit more of a show and tell um, session. We have other sessions that are a little bit more practical in, in nature, but this one really is a bit more of a presentation of the tool itself. So it's very straightforward when I've created a link. Um, all that I do is I can copy my long link um, and I can click over here and say create. Right now, my, let's give it a second. Right, if I click on create, it opens up this tab here um, on, the, on the right where I can just paste my long URL. And once I've pasted it, see there's a long, uncomfortable URL. No one's going to be able to retype that. What it does, it automatically creates a custom back half for my link. So you can leave it like this. If you want to leave it like this, there's the link. It is, it's already been created. Now, sometimes we create bitlies on the run and this is where we stop or we copy it and we share it and then we're done. I really promote the idea of just spending a few extra seconds and adding a title to it. So this one, um, as an example, we can call the e-learning online um, welcome, welcome screen, right? because that's what it links to. So I've given it a title. If I want to, I can customize the back half. Um, for this one, it's not really something that I need to customize, but when you're customizing, there's a, a few basic things that I think always works quite well. One of them is starting with, um, with either an abbreviation or an acronym or initialism, whatever you want to use. So in our case, uh, I often start with CWED for the Cape Wineland Education District. Remember, lowercase, 
uppercase makes a difference. So you, decide, you can decide which one you prefer to use. So let's say we use a lowercase. An underscore is also quite a useful thing to do. So let's call this the e-learning. E-learn welcome. Uh, typing has disappeared today. Right, e-learn welcome. So there I've created a custom back half for myself. Now to make life even easier, if I click add or create a tag, so now we'll call it webinar, let's add, add this to the webinars one. So you'll see what happens here is it says suggested tags, webinars, because this is a tag that I've used quite often. Now once I've done all of that, very important, you have to click save before the custom back half is updated. So you'll see at the top, Bitly it has given me now the custom back half, which I can then copy, now I've got my short link, and if I wanted to, I can paste it over here. It won't work because you don't have access to the file, so I'm not going to do that. But I can now share this Bitly link with anyone that I want to. And it will stay accessible at the moment, they say, for all of eternity. So it's not supposed to ever stop working. Um, the same was said about tinyurl, and then a lot of it stopped working um, at some point, but it won't, it, again, this time they've reiterated, it's not going to stop working. So it's not likely that you'll ever run into any issues with this. Right, so once this has been created, now if we go into my, um, in, into the, the interface of the system, you'll see here at the top, it shows me e-learning online welcome screen, right, with a grand total of zero clicks. So I can have a look at the, the clicks that I've received over here. It shows me I haven't received any clicks on this at all. Um, what's useful is because I've added titles to a lot of my, uh, to a lot of my, my um, Bitly links, I can easily see which links I need to have a look at. But what's also quite nice is if I click on top performing, it'll show me the links that have received the most, um, the, 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 that have received the most activity so far. So our learner resourcing site, if you haven't been there yet, bit.ly slash CWED learner, um, you'll see there's our learner resourcing site. It's, it has received 944 clicks in the last 30 days. Now, this is one of the very annoying limitations of the free, or for me at least, I don't think it's going to be too much of a problem for, um, for a lot of teachers, but the, f the, the free version of Bitly only allows you to track 30 days activity, not all of time. So you can only see the activity that you received in the last 30 days. You can also have a few more things. Where have the people been accessing the site from? Um, there's always some random things like that. I don't really see where the United States would be accessing it. You can also see where people are having are getting access to your Bitly link. So this becomes a nice way of, of keeping track of what's going on. And what I've done here as an example, um, is we've created a, uh, because I've got this webinars tag, if I search for webinars, it'll show me the link to all the webinar videos that we have, um, the, the views that they received in the last, over the last 30 days. Now, these links are not 100%, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, how we can actually make use of this and keep better track of what's, what's really, of the activity that these um, links have been receiving, right? So, the last thing I want to show you show you about Bitly, or just before I, I'm just going to change the presentation mode quickly. Are there any questions about Bitly at this point in time? You see, everyone's very quiet in the chat panel. If you have questions, please, you're more than welcome to ask. Right, I'm going to assume there are no questions then. Okay, so... I'm sorry, Yaku, can I, I just ask something? Quickly, is I wanted to show you what the, um, what the Bitly extension actually does for you. Sorry, I see, Ricky, did you want to ask a question? I just wanted to ask about that tag. Um, if you add a tag, does it mean that uh, um, the, the, the website Bitly will put all the, the similar tags in one group together? Or what's the yes. use of the tag? What, what happens um, with a tag thing is 
if you look here on the on the left, um, this list of of, of um, Bitly links here, all of them have this webinar tag. So if I want to just find all my all my links that I've tagged with a webinars tag, then I just type in here at the top webinars, and it'll show me all the the webinars, um, the ones with the webinar tag. Okay, that's thank you very much. It, it, it basically creates a little group for you. It makes it a lot easier for you to to access all of these things. Now, um, I just switched my presentation mode because I want to show you how this extension quickly works. If you haven't, I'll share the link to, to adding this extension as well. If you haven't used extensions yet, um, this part, part might be a little bit confusing, but the Bitly extension is very nice in the sense that um, you add a little, um, you, once you've added the Bitly extension, it becomes as simple as going to the site that you want to share and then clicking on the Bitly icon over there that I have, and it opens up this panel, which is exactly the same panel that you get when you go to the Bitly web app. The only nice thing is you don't need to physically go to that page. So we could open, um, for argument's sake, um, let's quickly go to, right, we're just going to go to this site over here. This is our e-learning site. So I can open up this page and I can click on the, the bit.ly link and you'll see the page stays open. And what's actually quite nice is it remembers that I already have this bit.ly um, saved. So it gives me the one that I've already created. So I can just copy it and use it again. So if I've already created a bit.ly link, It'll give me a link to that. If I haven't created one, so let's go to the courses, for example, um, and I click on the Bitly link, it'll create a new one for me with a custom back half. Right, the only thing that you need to keep in mind, once it's created that link, it has now been created. So if I actually go back, if I close this now, and I go back to my Bitly, to the, um, to the Bitly interface, that link that we just created will be here at the top. Can you see these two links that I have created to demonstrate? It will be there, which is annoying because I don't actually want to see these. So all that I can do is I can just click on them. I've selected these three things. I don't want to see them anymore. Here's a quick way to add a tag to your Bitly links if you've already created many of them. And I can just click on hide and they will still work. They just won't appear in my um, display because I've got 85 links. I don't want to necessarily have all of them displayed here, only the ones that are important and useful for me to keep track of. So this is only when you want to keep track of your links. Right, so if we go back to our ease of access presentation, what we also want to look at, so this is the one side of things, using the bit.ly links, the shortened bit.ly, um, the shortened links that you can make access to your, to your content easier. These are useful, as we said, when you want to um, when you want people to be able to retype it, if you want to add a link to a document, you don't want to add that long link, you want to add a um, short, easy to access link, then this becomes quite easy. The other option that we want to, want to look at is the QR code. And the QR code, I think, is something that many of us will be, will be quite familiar with. Um, but there's one or two little things about QR codes that I think are really important for us to keep in mind. So first and foremost, what is a QR code? You've probably all seen these things. QR codes are scannable images, very similar to a barcode, that will take your mobile device to any or whatever device you're using that has a camera on it, and it will re redirect that device to the said website. Um, so smart devices these days have QR codes installed on them by default. All of them have QR codes, QR readers, most of them work 100% fine, so you don't really need to bother with something. If you want to add something, I, I recommend adding Google Lens. It's got lots of very cool functionality um, to it. We're not going to look at that at all now, but it's, it's a very, what Google has done is they've taken Google Translate, they built it into Google Lens, a QR code's been built into Google Lens. It's a very, very nifty little tool. It's even got an OCR scanner, so you can take a photo of a hard copy document, convert it into text, and then you've, got, um, then you've got that text as well. So it's a very cool little um, tool to look at. So what the QR code does is, again, we'll take the same long link that we looked at um, earlier, and it transforms it into a QR code. This is something that we all have seen before, and we, um, well, not all have seen before, but I'm sure you, you must have seen it somewhere by now, and we generate this QR code, but you can also make it look quite cool and 
change and change and play around with the styling of the QR code. Please note the one on the right will work 100% um, as accurately as the one on the left. They say QR codes actually have up to a 30%. You can actually cover up to 30% of a QR code, and it will still be scannable and still go to the right um, to the right uh, URL. So it's very, very, very seldom that you actually experience any issues with QR codes directing you to the wrong place. So the bottom line is, and this is what I what I really want to to focus on a little bit. When should I use a QR code? Because what is happening a lot is people are sending a QR code to a mobile device. Um, keep in mind that if you're going to send a QR code to a mobile device, you can't scan that QR code unless you take another mobile device and scan the QR code on that device. So if you're going to send content to a mobile device, it makes a lot more sense to have something that is clickable, like a Bitly, for example, or just the link that you've made clickable. So keep that in mind. The QR code works very well when you're going to have a hard copy of a document, and you actually want to add web-based content. So a lot of a lot of the, the, the study guides and a lot of um, notes that you might have received these days, this is becoming a much more common, um, a co much more common thing that there'll be a QR code on there. The um, the resources that were created by the, the subject advisors that have been distributed to the schools, those have QR codes on them that you can scan to access these these resources. Um, another very useful use of a QR code that people don't often use is when you want to add an activity or a breakaway option in your presentation. So if you think about it, when you join this session, you would have noticed there's a QR code that you can scan for the, um, for the attendance register. There's also the link that I obviously posted in the chat, but if you joined and you hadn't seen that link, you could take your phone out, you, you could scan the QR code, and it will take you to that registration. Now, the same thing applies if you've got interactive elements to your presentation that you want learners to be part of. They're not necessarily going to have the presentation on their mobile devices. They might be sitting in the classroom. Um, you might be fortunate that you have a set of tablets at your school. Those learners could take the tablets and they can scan a QR code and it will take them to an interactive activity. So this is a way for learners to get because what happens is we give them a link that they now need to retype into their tablet and invariably they get it wrong. They struggle with this. This is where QR code can be incredibly useful, adding this element. And then whenever you're going to create an interactive, a uh, handout with interactive elements. So this really ties into the first point, um, but it's, it's, it's useful, for example, when you create a poster and you want, um, I know something that we used to use it at, at my previous school for is when um, parents would come to a parent evening or, or when we would have um, the open days, for example, when you want people to register, there are QR codes and they can scan the QR code and then they can, um, they can just quickly register themselves or they can scan a QR code and it'll take them to a map of the school so they can see where they are and where they need to go and things like that. So, so adding that kind of element is also useful um, in, in terms of the school management. But again, I'm going to say this again, QR codes only work when a person has a way to scan them. In other words, a mobile device. Um, you're not likely going to find laptops or desktops or anything like that that's going to have QR codes, QR scanners built into them. The assumption is if you're going to be on a desktop or a laptop, someone will send a link to you that you can click on to access the resource. Um, so be very mindful of, of these QR codes because I've quite often I've seen people sending QR codes over WhatsApp to learners telling them to access the resource, which obviously they will not be able to do. So be careful when you are doing things like that. Again, just like Bitly, or just sorry, just like the link shortness, there are lots of different QR generators out there. Um, and of course, we have our personal preferences. Um, everyone will have people use different tools. Um, the two that I want to look at today, and there's actually one that we're going to look at today, is QR Code Monkey, um, because I, I quite like the fact that, that QR Code Monkey is very straightforward and very easy to use, and it offers, it offers some nice customization, um, and, and more so than other free tools offer. Then, the most widely used one is QR Code Generator. 
Now, QR code generator has a very, very nice paid for system if you want to go for a little bit more of an upgrade. Then the paid for system is incredibly useful, but you can do a little bit less in terms of customizing your QR code. But if anything, I, I would say the QR code generator might be a little bit simpler in terms of the use of it. Um, but they essentially offer the same, the, the same kind of thing. There's one key thing that the QR code generators don't offer that your link shorteners do offer, and that is the ability to track activity. So a QR code, um, while both QR code monkey and QR code generator can track activity, neither one of them can actually, or for both of them, if you want to track activity, you need the paid version. Um, you can't do it with a free version. And I realize in, in, in terms of those tools, resources is often something that we don't have available to get a paid for um, version of CodeMonkey or QR Code Generator, etc. Obviously, the paid for version of these tools have lots of um, very nice, useful bells and whistles, but we won't promote something that you have to pay, in, pay for in order to use. These work perfectly fine if you use the free versions as well. So, QR Code Monkey. Let's just quickly talk through how it works. When you're going to create a QR code, um, very similar to very similar to, to any of the other um, tools that we have, there's a place where you're going to enter your URL. So any link that you copy and paste, again, we'll see this is the QR Code Monkey is also HTTPS, so also a secure site. Um, your first step will just be simply to paste the link in. Um, and we're going to get to this point to this in a second. Step two is to customize the QR code. So you'll see um, what's quite, what I like about QR Code Monkey is that you can change the colors. You can actually add a logo to it, and you can customize the design quite a bit. And then you generate your QR code. Now, one of the things that's a little bit annoying for me personally with a lot of these um, QR code generators is you have to download them. Very few QR code generators create a QR code that you can just use the link of the, the URL of the, the image that's created. They all kind of want you to download the, the file, which is, which is not too much of a hassle. We're going to look at that in a second and why it's not so difficult um, to, to, in fact, do. So with that said, let's actually go to QR Code Monkey and see how it works. Right, so this is QR Code Monkey. Um, right, so I'm sure you can all see this. QR code monkey, what I'm going to do, and the, I, I'm, I've changed my presentation mode, so you are going to see a little bit more of my screen now. You'll see why in a second we want to do that. So if we go to the um, online session welcome page again, again, we'll see there's a QR code. We have, we have our QR code over here. Um, and I haven't given you a bit.ly link on this because um, the idea is we'll paste our bit.ly links in the chat screen and the QR code um, is something you can scan while you wait. So all that we do is we're going to copy our, um, our URL here at the top, and then we will paste our URL over here, and it's going to create a QR code for me. Now, you'll notice it hasn't created a QR code yet because I haven't clicked on Create QR Code. If I click on Create QR Code, it'll now create a QR code with millions and millions of little blocks over there, as you see. Um, which is sometimes not such a nice, it, it, it's a bit of an uncomfortable QR code to, to create. So what becomes useful then is if we now go to a shortened, if we actually use a bit.ly link, so we're going to take the same presentation over here. We're going to generate our bit.ly, which we actually did earlier. Sorry, I need to go just to go out of the presentation. Um, uh, sorry, that thing is not, not doing what it's supposed to do. Right, so we're going to create our bit.ly over here. Please note the reason why it wasn't creating the bit.ly was the thing was already in presentation mode. So we'll just take this link that we've created over there. And now we're going to create a QR code again. Now, one thing that you'll note, when we create a QR code based on the short URL, way fewer blocks, much easier, actually presents a lot nicer. 
because the way that the QR code works is the longer your link is, the more complicated your QR code will be that you generate. So what I always find is a very useful little trick to make sure that my QR codes don't look too clumsy is to generate a bit.ly and to use the bit.ly and create a QR code based on the bit.ly. The other advantage of doing that is what's effectively going to happen um, is when a person scans the QR code, the mobile device will use that information from the QR code, go to the bit.ly, which will then take them to the actual link that they want to go to. Now, this doesn't really use any extra, um, extra data from anyone, so it's not something you need to be concerned about. But what's nice about this is we can actually now, using this little trick, have a simpler um, QR code that actually displays a lot better on the one hand. And because we are using a bit.ly, we also have added the tracking element to our link, which you won't be able to do if you're only going to use a QR code. Now, again, as I said, both QR Code Monkey and QR Code Generator have tools that you can use, tr that you can track with, but they are very limited um, unless you use the paid for tools. So just to show you a little bit what we can do if we want to get a bit silly with um, our QR Code, it gives you the option. We're going to make it really a bit, um, we're going to go completely crazy here. Let's make this one red and let's make this green. Um, this is not going to be a pretty one, but it's going to be a little bit silly. Um, we'll make this one black. And we can even change our background color to something. Um, let's make it something bright over there. If you want to, you can add a logo image. They've got a few default ones, but you can upload your own um, image if you've got your own logo that you would like to use. So some teachers want to maybe design a custom little logo. Maybe we just want to add WhatsApp to it. So we're just going to add the, the WhatsApp image. Then custom design. Now you can go really crazy and add something a bit more silly to it. Um, so let's add that block and use this block and use that one over there. Well, this one is actually usually quite nice. So now we're going to say create QR code. And you'll see something that looks a bit crazy over there. But again, it is still scannable and it's still accessible the same way that it would normally be. If you're a little bit worried about this because maybe this one is a bit too far out there the one thing i the first one that you need to remove if this one does struggle is just remove the logo because the logo covers up some of the blocks and then we create something that looks like that it's a little bit simpler it's a little bit easier to scan so we can create a QX like that and it's still scannable um which a lot of these things, as, as, as if we look at it, it seems it's a bit over the top perhaps, but at the end of the day, this is all about, it, it's, it's all about adding that, um, that element of engagement with learners. If they see, they've all seen the boring old QR codes, if they suddenly see something that looks like this, they might be a bit more intrigued with this, especially if you're going to spend some time designing your presentation um, and you really want to spend time making sure that it looks good then it could be nice to add a little bit, to, to spend a bit of time creating a, a nicer looking QR code as well. Um, not that it has any added functionality. Now, when we want to insert our QR code, um, when, we, when we want to insert our QR code, so I'm just gonna quickly exit this presentation. Just as an example, before we get to that, um, if we have a black slide over here, when we go to the QR code monkey and we click download PNG, It'll now download this QR code for me. And this is how I find it's the easiest way to do it. When you download it, the download will appear over there. If you're using um, PowerPoint or Word, anything like that, you can click on that, drag it to that. In this instance, I'm using um, Google Slides. So I simply click on this and I drag it over to my screen and there I'll have my QR code that I've added to my presentation. And it's a bit over the top. It looks a bit silly, but it'll work 100% fine. So if I wanted to add this as a, as a link to a quiz or a um, Google form or a video or whatever it is that you want to link to, it's nice to be able to add this to a presentation. So when I'm presenting, learners can see this and they can scan it. So even when we're doing, um, some of you who, who have been in these, these sessions before might have seen that we do this from time to time. 
we can add a QR code even to these online webinars where you can sit at home, you can take out your phone, you can scan this QR code and you will end up getting somewhere. In this instance, I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen if you scan the QR code. I think it'll take you to a file that'll say you do not have access to view this file because that's not something we want to look at. Right. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. I know we went quite quickly, but as we said, the video has been recorded and will be put on, um, on our platform so that you can access it afterwards. This is also the moment that you need to take to ask questions. If there's something that you're uncertain about, something that you want to know, um, we have a bit of time now. If there are questions, please fire away. Just make sure if you want to ask a question, you can either, this is now the opportunity where you can actually unmute yourself and ask a question. Just don't talk to the screen without your sound coming through. Just make sure to unmute yourself first. Um, Martinez, in terms of making a custom links with Bitly, just make sure that you actually um, register a user because if you are if you're not signed in, um, if you're just one can use Bitly without actually registering and signing in, but you'll have to first sign in to start being able to create those custom links. Another thing that I forgot to say with the custom links, um, keep in mind that you are limited to creating. 30 custom backends per month. So it's a it's a strange thing that we ran into the other day. It's not likely that um, people run into that, that issue, but you can only create 30 custom backends per month. 